Like the kind of stuff that I like watching is low concept, small, real small stories, real, just like you're getting into character. That's why people talk about character films. You're getting into character discussions. To me, that's way more interesting than watching, you know, Dr. Magneto fight aliens, whatever it is on the Marvel movies. Like, <laughs> I can't get into it. It's so it. funny. You just like mix like three genres. Like everyone else is <laughs> screaming right now Probably. because you just messed that up so bad. Yeah, I you did. You could not have messed it up so more like worse. I couldn't unless have messed you said more. DC. You're listening to Screenwriters Need to Hear This with Michael Jam. All right, everyone. Welcome back to Screenwriters Need to Hear This. This is our podcast. And we're going to talk today. Today's topic is, it's not the idea, it's the execution. How about that? Mm. Like that idea? I think it's an, it's an important subject. <laughs> it's, an, it's an important subject because I hear this a lot, you know, for a number of reasons. People always think that, you know, I have a great idea for a screenplay. Or how do I come up with a great idea for a screenplay? And like my point is, you don't even need a great idea for a screenplay. You just need a good idea and you need to execute it really well. This seems like one of those early questions. I remember thinking about this, but it's almost like forums and message boards and um, social media probably these days talk about how you need to protect your ideas. You need to protect your ideas. And people are so concerned about it. And it almost comes from a place of um, of scarcity. Yep. Like, uh, this is my only my only sacred nuggets, the only idea I have. And how do I make sure? Because this is, this is the one. This is the grand slam that's going to get me in the door. Yeah, and you're right. It does come from scarcity. Someone made a comment on, uh, I did, a, I guess, a video a couple days ago, and she left a comment that she had an idea. You probably remember better than I do. She had an idea for a screenplay, and then... Yeah, she was called in. I think some managers or someone called her in to pitch it. She posted an idea on social media, and then the manager like wanted to hear it, and she went in and pitched everything, and then a week or two later found out that that studio was making an idea very similar to hers, and... She was like pretty, I don't think she clear, like came out and just said they stole my idea. But she's like interesting how that happens. Mm-hmm. And I thought you had a really good reply to that comment. What did I, what did I say, Phil? I don't even remember. <laughs> <laughs> I think you're like, yeah, this is why most professionals won't even read yeah, yeah. unsolicited materials because too often we're all working on a similar idea mm-hmm. and it's not uncommon for someone else to sell something and then you scrap a project. Yeah, that's, that, yeah, that's right. That's what I said. <laughs> because it's right. Like That's why I won't read anybody's script. Because I don't, I, I could be working on something similar, and now they're going to sue me that for stealing it. And it's like, no, it's just out in the zeitgeist. It's out in the air. We're we're all kind of all working on the same kind of thing. And so, like, maybe this production company stole her idea, or, or maybe not. Maybe they just had something similar in the pipeline. But I told her that she should be encouraged because it means that uh, she, her mind is her her thinking is in the right place. Mm-hmm. That she's coming up with good ideas that are in the right area, right ballpark, and that she should just keep on working, coming up with more ideas because she's onto something. I've heard other people talk about this. It's like, okay, um, disaster films. It was like Volcano. Mm -hmm. And then is it Dante's Peak or something like that? Yeah, came out at the same time. It it happens like very frequently that two films with the same premise are coming out about the same time. Almost every year that that happens. Yeah. So it's not like you... So people, I guess a lot of people are worried about how do they protect their scripts. And I don't give legal advice because I'm not a lawyer. But I, I will say that I've only once... Like you can go to the Writers Guild anybody, you don't have to be a member and you could register your script. And I remember I registered my script, one script that I wrote 30 years ago, it probably costs like 35 bucks. It's not a lot of money, but I don't, I'm not even sure what kind of legal protection you have. And I haven't since done it. And I'm not telling you to do it or not to do it, but there's that if you want to look into it. And that's one of those things like, so again, I'm not an attorney, but what I can speak a little bit about some copyright advice I have received from attorneys in the past Mm -hmm. working from my business perspective. And that is the moment that you write something, you have an implicit copyright on that thing. Right. You design something, it's yours, and, and you have that. The benefit of the Writer's Guild registration really is it puts a timestamp on it. Right. It says, hey, this was submitted this date by this person. Um, the other thing and the only real proper way to copyright something is to submit that file to the U.S. Copyright Office. And then they have it on file. But that's public domain. And you can literally just Google it and click on a link to any print document. If someone really wants to rip you off, they, you've now established a chain where they can find those things. Right. So I think you said that in the past you used to mail a letter to yourself. You yeah. Like put it in a, so it had a postmark on it. Right. But, you know, this is an interesting thing that I've heard very often. And I remember, I feel like we might have talked about this on another podcast, so forgive me if it's repeating. But... I remember I submit, when I first moved to Los Angeles, I sent a feature that I wrote to one of my professors in film school. And the first note I got back was, 
make sure that you get this registered with the Riders Guild. That's that protection that makes the the guild a real a real union, a real guild. And I was like, um, okay, first of all, no one in LA does that. And from <laughs> what I understand, putting that it's registered with the Riders Guild is kind of a sure sign that you're uh, you're new. It could right. it could be, but I don't want to tell people not to do it though. So right, I don't know. right, but it's but it's perceived from what I've heard from industry professionals is mm-hmm. this perception of oh this guy's new right. because or this girl's new because you're saying you know you're so concerned about that that someone's going to steal your idea and I, and in in your notes we'll talk more about why that's not the case like people don't want to steal your idea. yeah but I think they first what they want to do is they want to hire you if you if you're good and you write and you write a good writer and you have a good idea it seems like it's just much easier for them to hire you and pay you than to risk for litigation sure. <laughs> so and, and secondly like that note annoyed me because it's like okay this is a this is a federally recognized union like they are as legitimate as they can be they don't need my 35 dollars mm-hmm. to ver- validate the writers guild right right I'm not I'm not a member of the guild I'm just a guy so anyway I think it's an interesting note in my perspective as as someone you know with half a foot in the industry is it's it doesn't really help you that much and I wouldn't stress too much about it yeah, I mean, or and just and it, by the way, if, if this is just your one, if you think you only have one idea, then you got a problem because, like, let's say you sell it, then then what are you going to do? What's your what's your encore? Mm-hmm. So you got to have to have a lot of scripts, a lot of ideas, and and what I it's so interesting we're talking about this, but what I really was going to get to, which is what the title of this episode is, it's not the idea, it's the execution, because you could sell your idea. But, or you can you can pitch them your idea. Hey, I got an idea about a, a, a magician who becomes a cop. But so unless it, it's all about the execution, whether it's going to be good or bad. And I and I give a lot of examples like I have a couple of examples. Like, let's say, Phil, I pitched you an idea and this is my idea for a movie. It's about a guy. He's a young guy, he's maybe 21 years old. And uh, he winds up having sex with an older woman. And then he gets a little tired of he has a you know has an affair with her. He gets a little tired of her, and then he winds up nailing her daughter. Like that sounds like the plot of a porno, right? I mean, yeah. it does. It sounds that's a terrible idea. It sounds like the plot right. of a porn, and for sure. But that's also the plot of The Graduate, which is like right. the best movie, one of the best movies ever made. Right? Yeah, every every film student has just studied that film for forever. Yeah, I watched yeah. it recently, and I was like, "This is amazing." I watched it. I watched it years ago, and I watched it again. It's a fantastic movie. But so it's not the idea that it was any good. It was the execution of that idea that's good. Right. So, what are you going to pitch that idea and like some, someone's going to rip it off? They're going to turn it into a porn, or you're going to write it and you're going to turn it into the graduate. So, and another example. Here's an, here's another equally bad idea. Tell me if you want to make this movie. I think it's terrible. Okay. Uh, good. <laughs> a painfully shy girl can find love for everyone but herself. I mean. That sounds like a bad sounds idea. Awful. It just that sounds like, like a bad idea. It's very generic. You've seen it a thousand times. It's also right. the plot of Amelie, which is one of the best mm-hmm. movies I've ever I've ever watched. I love that movie. And so it's that's the execution. The idea is okay. The execution was fantastic. Um, yeah. Here's another idea, which is also terrible. Um, a girl goes on a hike, and she, a girl goes on a long walk, a long hike, and she and she finds herself. So, so boring. That sounds boring. It sounds pretty generic. That's the plot of one of my, I just watched this again, Wild, starring uh, uh, Reese Reese Witherspoon and written by Cheryl Strayed and written by uh, Nick Hornby. Fantastic, small little movie. It's just small. It's it's real and small, but the idea wasn't any good. You know, it's the execution of the idea is fantastic. So that, okay, so let's talk about that then because, you know, this might be out of, out of scope for our conversation here, but the term high concept mm-hmm. film, this is like a big buzzword. I heard a lot when I was first studying it and it, it took a while for me to really understand and grasp what is a high concept film. Is this why studios respond so much to a high concept film? The definition that I've heard being you see the entire movie when you read the, the log line. Yeah, probably. It's probably easier to market. I mean, high concept would be, you know, some guy gets magic powers and then can read minds or, or a uh, high concept would be, you know, fighting aliens like Men in Black. You know, that's a high concept yeah. movie. Um, <clears throat> but this is this is a low concept. Like Wild is a low concept movie. It's very small and very real. And in my opinion, I don't really know too much about this, but but in my opinion, it's like the kind of stuff that I like watching is low concept, small, real mm-hmm. small stories, real. Just like you're getting into character. That's why people talk about character films. You're getting into character mm-hmm. discussions. To me, that's way more interesting than watching, you know, 
Dr. Magneto fight aliens, whatever it is on the Marvel movies. Like, <laughs> I can't get into it's so it. so funny. You just like mix like three genres. Like everyone else is <laughs> screaming right now Probably. because you just messed that up so bad. Yeah, I you did. You could not have messed it up so more like worse. I couldn't have messed it up. said DC. Like, but anyway. I'm not into those hilarious. Marvel movies. Like I'm honestly, I find that boring. I find it boring. I get it. I... It's an interesting place because I come from like the trashiest of TV with my dad. He loved just B sci-fi movies. Um, you know, I grew up. My favorite movie when I was a kid was um, was Rambo Three, where Rambo goes off and helps the Taliban fight the Russians, right? And with the U.S. money, right? Right. Um, but then at the same time, I spent you know ten years volunteering at the Sundance Film Festival. I had the opportunity to sit there and watch these beautiful independent films, right? And I just gained such appreciation for really small moments that tell true stories about real people yeah and it you know and those are the ones i love I, those are the ones i still think about and the ones i'll put in the when I'm, I'm bored and i want something to do i'll put in a film i've seen already a thousand times and just let it let me feel something yeah rather than just adrenaline pumping through my veins it, it seems to me i completely agree but and it seems to me that like if you want to become a writer in hollywood start off by writing something small you're not gonna Start off by writing small. If you can prove that you can write small, then they'll give you the bigger assignments where you're writing these Marvel movies. But I don't, I don't think you can get out of if you come out of the bat and you write something like that's so special effects heavy. Like reading that on page is pretty boring. It's like re, what, like reading a car chase on on the page is boring, and reading about aliens blowing each other up is boring. But reading about small human emotions is is very interesting. And so yeah. I would say start off writing small and then maybe someday someone will hire you to, you know, make a Marvel movie. That's something I strayed away from because I, you know, I heard like, oh, you need to think about your emotions and embed your own life story in these mm-hmm. things. Like you're not the protagonist, but your life story adds value and, and connection to the, to the reader or the audience. And I had a real hard time with that because I did not want to access my emotions from, you know, trauma of my childhood and all these things I went through. And it wasn't until I really learned to be vulnerable with mm-hmm. those things that I felt like my writing started to really excel. That's right. And I'm glad you mentioned it because that's your that's actually your ace in the hole. <laughs> all that abuse yeah. that you suffered <laughs> is going to make you rich. But but yeah. it, but that's how it is. It's like all the, you know, when you write from your emotions, like all the scars from your childhood, that's the gold. And so don't lean into it. Don't run from it. Lean into it and, and like examine it and explore it because talking about your vulnerabilities and your, and your weaknesses. I just did a post on this today, actually. One of the it was interesting. I did I did a TikTok live yesterday, and then someone said, someone said, "How do you stay so grounded?" And I I got real, um, you know, I I didn't even want. To, I made a joke out of it. I was like, "That's a better question for my butler, Higgins." How do I stay so grounded? And then I just kind of blew. I just blew past it. And then I, later in the day, I kind of came back to it, and I was like, "You know what? I should have answered that question truthfully. It would have been more helpful." Yeah. And and. I didn't want to answer because I felt like, well, the minute, the minute you tell yourself how grounded you are, you're patting yourself on the back and then you're not being grounded. You're just being a douche. But the thing about the, the job of being a writer, it's like any good writer, it's like if you look at yourself up here and, and everyone else is down here because I'm successful and I'm this and that, like now you're not relating to people. Your job as a writer and an actor as well is to, is to uh, you know, reflect the human condition. So mm-hmm. you have to be on the same level. You have to see people on the same level. We're all in this together. We're all, and so I'm sharing my vulnerabilities. You're sharing your vulnerabilities and your weaknesses and your insecurities. And by doing that, people are like, oh, wow, that's how I feel. I feel the mm-hmm. same way. And so that's how, like, if you talk about being grounded, well, that's your job. If you want to be a good writer, your job is to remain grounded. Hi guys, it's Michael Jammin. I wanted to take a break from talking and talk just a little bit more. I think a lot of you people are getting bad advice on the internet. Many of you want to break into the industry as writers or directors or actors, and some of you are paying for this advice on the internet. It's just bad. And as a working TV writer and showrunner, this burns my butt. So my goal is to flush a lot of this bad stuff out of your head and replace it with stuff that's actually going to help you. So I post daily tips on social media. Go follow me at Michael Jammin Writer. You can find me on Instagram and Facebook and TikTok. And let's be honest, if you don't have time, like just two minutes a day towards improving your craft, it's not going to happen. So go make it happen for you at Michael Jammin Writer. Okay, now back to my previous one. I think that the movies that flop at the box office are the ones that do not stay grounded. And we can t- look at the Marvel films, which I'm a big fan of, mm-hmm. and 
they are so incredibly grounded that when we watch, you know, the last uh, Marvel film with Iron Man in it, people are in tears. Mm-hmm. Spoiler, if you haven't seen it by now, like, Tony Stark sacrifices himself and dies to save the universe. Oh, okay. I didn't see that. All right. Right? Right at the end. He, ab- like, and it's this beautiful, and literally grown men sobbing in the room. Wow, okay. Because it's about, and like, and I got chills talking about it, because it's about human sacrifice. Mm-hmm. And we've all sacrificed a part of our lives for something. As a new father, I'm definitely learning that. Yep. Right? It's not about me anymore at all. And I have to set aside my ego and just, what can I do to make that little girl have the best life possible? I warned you. And that's, <laughs> you did, you did, everyone else did, mm-hmm. but, it, but it's human sacrifice. And it's a tale that we all respect and appreciate because in our own way, it's a metaphor for life and what we go through on a daily basis for family, for friends, for those in need. And, um, and, and it's your personal experience with that attribute yeah that speaks to people yeah this was a huge part of some of the some of the things i got to do as a robert redford scholar i got to go sit in these sundance led workshops with joan this wonderful almost a coach on writing and storytelling and she would make you analyze your life and she'd ask you these questions that you had to read aloud exposing some of your deepest deepest darkest secrets or insecurities or fears and then write a monologue with a character you just made up in a five-minute bullet point session. And just embedding those in that story. I mean, people would cry in those rooms. Mm-hmm. It's something you just wrote in half an hour. Yeah. Because it's so real. And your the specificity of your experience speaks to the specificity of my experience. That's right. And I think... I have I know exa- I would do the same thing. I'd feel the same way, or I didn't do the same thing, but I ended up in the same result, and and that's the beauty of execution, right? That's is funny because we weren't we weren't planning on talking about this, but <clears throat> my side project right now is I'm, I'm working on a collection of personal essays because I just I think it's. I was like, gonna say I think <laughs> you talk about this in your course in your essay section. You talk about mining your life for uh, for ideas from your essays and and how your your style. I think you mentioned it is a little bit you know, self deprecation, mm-hmm. you put yourself down a little bit. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Anyway, go ahead. Well, that's, I mean, that's, that's kind of what I've been doing for the past year or so. It's like, right. I write these little stories about my life, but I'm not famous or terribly interesting. But so I, when I write these stories about me, I'm really, I'm getting telling specifics from my life so that I can tell your story so that I can, so you've felt the same way, but the, the details are mine, but the stories, all of ours. And so yeah. don't, yeah, don't, uh, don't you? You're sitting on a gold mine. All of you are sitting on a gold. You just may not realize it. And those are the small stories. And I would just say, as someone who had took years to go through and break through, thinking about childhood issues and trauma and, and things that I went through, like it's worth it. Not only for freeing up yourself, but that vulnerability of owning your experiences. No one looks down on you for those no. things, whatever they are. No. Your your problems are probably worse than mine, and mine are probably worse than some of yours. But they're all problems. And not a single person looks down on you right. for it. They they respect you more mm-hmm. for what you've done. And overcoming those things leads to the freedom to talk about them in a way that is purely vulnerable. And again, that is the stuff that just makes us cry. And, you know, there's that beautiful, I don't know if you ever watched the movie, the show Entourage. I have watched it, yeah, sometimes. Yeah, do you, do you remember when they went to the Sundance Film Festival and the, the box office attendant standing next to James Cameron? Uh-huh. She's like, so when the Titanic sank, were you predicting the economic bubble burst of the 1999? Uh-huh. And he's like, I just wanted to make girls cry. Right, right. <laughs> like that's, Yeah, that's, that's right. That's so funny. But I just you, want to make girls cry. But th- that's, you know, to get back actually to that question that person asked me about, like, how do you stay grounded? It's like, had I... If I if I brag about myself or if I talk about my strengths, people will hate me, and if I talk about my weaknesses and insecurities, people will like me. So that's how you stay grounded, and that's what you got to put into your work, as we talk about. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So mm. that's beautiful. You, so I, I just as like a bit of a segue here to implementing this. How do you differentiate your ideas? Like what what you take these? Like how would you tell that story differently? And I think that. The, this top note in our show notes that you were going to go through, this idea, oh. I, that might be worth bringing oh. up and reading through. Yeah. So, right. I almost skipped over that. So, um, like, let's say you have an idea. And the idea is a mobster falls in love with an, M- an FBI agent who's pursuing him, right? If you gave that, that's whatever, it's an average idea. But if you gave that idea to three different writer-directors, if you give it to Quentin Tarantino 
and Wes Anderson and Charlie Kaufman. That one idea, you would, they would each come back with three very, very different movies. Yeah. Tarantino's would be would be bloody, <laughs> gory, over the top, and 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 very di- very rich with like long dialogue, heavy monologues, which are you know uh, would be wonderful. But Wes Anderson, he would do something completely different. It'd be quirky and small, and more could be really really caught in the details. And then Charlie Kaufman would be uh, you know it'd be surreal. It would be bizarre and off the planet, um, and metaphysical even. So. You're right. That's one idea. So it's, it's all about that. The idea is worthless. It's the execution of the idea that, that matters something. So, you know, when, yeah. you, when you talk about, oh, I have a, how do I get a great idea? Or, or I have a great idea. It's a lot of times people say, I have a great idea for a movie, but I, you know, I'm not a writer. Well, screw you, man. So you, who gives a shit? You know, I'm, a- I'm everyone. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> a- everyone has a great idea, right? Right. Like, and that's the thing. I, I got a great idea for a movie. Like, Okay. Yeah, so write it. Spe- spe- spend a decade. Learn learn the craft, yeah. man. Learn the formatting. Like there's software that'll help you, but ultimately it's the execution, like you're saying. Like I and it's interesting too, and I don't know if this applies, but you know, I've been trading note I've been reading notes for some of the people in our class, like uh, in your course like Dave Crossman and, mm-hmm. and he's been re giving me notes and you know, I've got this group of people that worked on Tacoma FD with me and we're in this writer's group and sharing stuff. Um, and ultimately and I just blinked on where I was going with this. So, Alden, you're probably going to have to cut this piece out. <laughs> well, you I, I blinked on it. Oh, well. We'll, we'll continue. Hopefully you'll, you'll, hopefully you'll find it. Uh, your writer's group. It'll, it'll come back in a second. Anyway, um, I was going to ask, have you seen Donnie Darko? I haven't. Okay. I want to say, and I apologize, I'll put it in the show notes. Um, Richard Kelly, I think, is the guy who wrote it. Um, and he tells an interesting story on another screenwriting podcast where he says, um, yeah, as soon as Donnie Darko came out, which I love, I think it's just one of the best I'll, films I'll that exists. It. Okay. So it's a really good psychological thriller. Watch the director's cut. Don't watch the regular one. Okay. The director's cut makes way more sense. Um, but anyway, he tells a story about how, oh, after out of the success of that, I got brought in to write this other film that ends up becoming like a very famous film. I don't remember the exact one. I'll try to find it and put it in the notes. He says, and I gave them mine and they're like, what the hell is this? And he's like, well, I wrote it. And they're like, this is nothing like what we wanted. And he's like, well, you know what kind of stories I tell. You've seen my movie, right? Mm-hmm. And they were ultimately like, I guess so. And they fired him off the project because mm-hmm. he didn't execute it to the tone that they wanted in the style. Right. They had like, you know, science fiction elements involved in it. He's like, but this is who I am as a writer. Why would you ever think I'm going to give you something different than that? Yeah, it's hard. And, and so, like, that's why when people say, you know, I have an idea, like, unless you're a writer, you don't even know if you have a good idea because you, there may not be enough meat on the bone or you may not have to, I don't know, it just, it seems an odd thing to say, I have an idea, how do I find a writer to write it? Well, you should write it, learn how to write. And if you don't know how to write, then you don't know how to, your idea is worthless, really, you know? Do you get that question a lot? Yeah, I, people hit, give me that question a lot. The only time I will take an idea when someone's not a writer is if they're like a famous producer or a studio executive. When it, if a studio exec says, hey, I have an idea for a TV show, will you write it? My partner will like, yeah, we'll do it. Even if it's not a good idea, we'll do it because they'll buy, you know, they'll they'll get it made. They'll get it on the air. We do it. So it's not their idea that we're responding to. It's their attachment to the idea that we like. Yeah. It doesn't even matter what their idea is almost. It's very, you know, because, you know. Because the, it's a, that's a business decision. That's a business right? decision, That's right. not a... An artistic decision. Yeah, it's not a creative decision. It's like, okay, if, if as long as the idea is in the ballpark that we can do it somehow, maybe indecently, then, then we're interested and we'll, we'll pursue it a little more. But, you know, some guy off the street has an idea. I don't care. Go ahead and write it. Right. <clears throat> yeah. It's so fascinating. So what, what else do you have in terms of other ways of differentiating ideas? Like, do you have any techniques or tips for recommendations for people? You know, it's, it's funny. We talk about this in the course a lot. How to, When you come up with an idea, how to know if there's enough meat on the bone. Mm-hmm. And so a lot of times, this, I was bad at this in the beginning of my career. I'd come up with an idea. Oh, likewise, likewise it, it end, ends up being like a runner or a C story. Yeah. It's not, not an A story at all. Yeah. So you have to know whether there's enough an emotional attachment to, to flesh out whether it's a half hour or an hour of television or 90 minutes of a movie. So that's kind of like what we go into a lot in the course, but that's how I differentiate whether the idea is good enough to turn into, you know, a a script. Do you want to explain real fast, uh, just in case people don't know, the difference between A, B, C story and a runner? Well, yeah, it's mostly for television. So 
in, in TV, the A story is usually the one that has most emotional weight. And that's the story uh, that are usually you, that'll occupy like two or th- hopefully three characters or more. But let's say you have five characters on your TV show. What are the other three? What are they going to do this episode? So you got to give them something to do. Then you give them a B story, which is much small, which is like lighter. It doesn't have the emotional weight. It usually tends to be a little funnier, a little broad, maybe sometimes broader, a little more out there. But you're doing, you're only doing the B story to service these other actors that you're paying because you don't want to pay them to sit in the dressing room. And also because the people at home want to see these a- actors on TV. They, you know, they don't want to, you know, they like these actors. So it's really about servicing those characters. And sometimes you'll have a C story or a runner, sometimes we call it, which is like a very thin little story. And that's just to service the last character who we couldn't figure out to squeeze in the A or the B story. <laughs> so And he's just a quick pop in, right? Like a, Yeah. Yeah. It's just like a little thing here and there. Right. Like a running joke awesome. sometimes. Yeah. Yeah. I was I was wondering we you know, a couple episodes, uh, you know, and This is just an idea I have. It's something that I learned early on I thought was a really good practice, which is, you know, a way of breaking down and making sure your ideas are not a cliche, which is what most of our ideas are. And I'm slowly realizing that most ideas, when young writers start, it's just fan fiction of their favorite show. Oh, okay. It's like, this is, oh, I like Star Trek, so I write something that's like Star Trek and ends up being almost fan fiction of it. Right. Um, But this idea of breaking down and saying, hey, my, my idea might be a cliche, he's come up with seven different ways Seven. Take that idea and figure out what is the thing about this that I, I like the most. What's the the main point that I think is the best, and then from there, what are seven other stories I could tell that include that main point, that that thing that excites me. Or what's a fresh spin on this old story? Is there a fresh yeah. spin on the scene? Even if the story is all tired and cliche, cliche, how can you make it seem fresh and original? So, yeah. like I was talking about Amelie, like tired old story, but they made it fresh by you know they they he, the writer director really made it fresh. So, yeah, no, well done. Well, I think that's uh, that's all we have on our notes. Do you have any other thoughts for anybody? Or that's it. Like that? That's it. Keep following. I guess you know we I post. Um, what should I talk about? I post daily yeah. on Instagram and on TikTok. I try to do five minutes. A, it takes me about five or ten minutes a day. I can I can afford to do that. And so I post on at Michael Jammin Writer. Come follow me. If you don't have time, Phil, and anyone else, if you don't have time to listen to three minutes of screenwriting help every day, <laughs> you know. And then you don't have time to, to try to pursue the profession. Like that should be the least, you, you know, that's the least investment you could do is just listen to three minutes. And because and, that way you can give some thought the rest of the day, even if you don't have time to write. OK, at least now you have a new thought percolating in your head and that'll help. Yeah. I had a really interesting conversation with someone in the business world this morning about meditation and, mm. and how it applies and things. And, you know, a really good piece of advice I got in the in the religious world was, you know, when you're reading, if you have a daily scripture practice, you read something and then you can meditate on it throughout the rest of it. You think about it, it's in your head percolating and you're going through that. Um, it applies to this as well. It applies to the fact that, okay, this is a thought and how do I apply it? And you can, it can be a meditation practice in of itself where you, you push out all the other thoughts and you really just spend some time thinking about one, one course. Uh, the other thing that I think is valuable about going to your social media and paying attention is it's, it's basically a benchmark or a barometer test for yourself about how dedicated you are to mm-hmm. your career path. Yeah. If I'm not doing things that a screenwriter or a writer would do every single day, can I say I am on the path to being a screenwriter? Someone, someone left a, I, I, then we'll sign off because I, I think we're getting a little long, but someone left a comment on one of my TikToks yesterday. I did a live and someone asked, how do I, I just, I want to be a screenwriter, but I'm just not motivated. How do I get my, how do I make, get my motivation there? And I'm like, dude, no one's coming for you. No one's coming for you. No one's coming to help. No one's going to rescue you. You're on an island. No one's going to save you. No one's going to push you. No one's going to help you. No one's going to write you. No one's going to... If you don't... If you're not going to do it for yourself, it's not going to get done. So Mm -hmm. if you're not motivated, find something else that motivates you. Yeah. You know? Yeah. I think things are a great way to end a podcast. That's a good way. Okay. (laughs) All right. It's the best way yet, Michael. Yeah. All right, everybody. Thank you so much for uh, listening, and we'll catch you on the next one. Thank you. This has been an episode of Screenwriters Need to Hear This with Michael Jammin and Phil Hudson. If you'd like to support this podcast, please consider subscribing, leaving a review, and sharing this podcast with someone who needs to hear today's subject. If you're looking to support yourself, I'd encourage you to consider investing in Michael's screenwriting course at michaeljammin.com slash course. 
I've known Michael for over a decade, and in the past seven years, I've begged him to put something together. During the global COVID-19 pandemic, Michael had time, and I have to say, I wish I'd had this course 10 years ago. As someone who's personally invested in most online courses, earned a bachelor's degree, and actively studied screenwriting for over a decade, this course has been more valuable to me than most of the effort I've put in because it focuses on something no one else teaches, story. In his course, Michael pulls back the curtain and shows you exactly what the pros do in a writer's room, and that knowledge has made all the difference for me, and I know it will for you too. You can find more information at michaeljammon.com course. For free daily screenwriting tips, follow Michael on Instagram, Facebook, and TikTok at Michael Jammon Writer. You can follow me on Instagram, Facebook, and TikTok at Phil A. Hudson. This episode was produced by Phil Hudson and edited by Dallas Crane. Until next time, keep writing.